on something to talk about. We'll catch up with Carla, Borja that is. Carla is the deputy director of the Department of Corrections. She takes us inside the prison to talk about the programs and the methods to rehabilitate Guam's criminals and deliver them back into the community. That's what's on Something to Talk About. Thank you for joining us today at King's for something to talk about. Carla Borja is with us today, and we are really excited to have you here because I, I, the few times that I have ever spoken to you, you're like one of those multitaskers. You know, I mean, you're early when I'm awake and, right. and doing the show, so right. it, there are very few uh, Gov Guam, uh, you know, supervisors or seniors that you can actually contact that early in the morning. So it's six in the morning. That. At six in the morning. <laughs> yes. Uh, but uh, Carla is the deputy director over the Department of Corrections. A lot of great things that have been happening in the past year yes. uh, with DOC. Um, and a lot of things that, that that is right up your alley, I think. Yeah. Yes, yes. The, the, first of all, we're gonna, it's a sort of a get to know Carla <clears throat> because you're leading an agency that has seen a lot of problems in the past couple of decades, which is very difficult to oversee right but clearly your expertise coming in sort of late to this to this party in this in this process of where doc is now progressed almost to the, 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 the almost to the point where it feels like this is almost over right yeah. right and it's kind of it's kind of like uh, i guess coming home like a full circle of where i've been yeah. in my uh professional career so well you know i i was saying to somebody who was calling on the radio uh, that you came from Senator Brant McCready's office. Yes, I did. But it's more than just coming from Senator Brant McCready's office. Say, can't put somebody like you in a position like that if you don't know what your business is. Yeah. Right. That's yeah. correct. So I've tell me. Tell. Go ahead. Oh, okay. sorry. So yes, I've uh, I started my career in law enforcement. So I got my bachelor's degree at the University of Guam mm -hmm. in criminal justice, and then I went on to get my master's degree at Shamana University in criminal justice administration. And my emphasis in my thesis study was on uh, criminal justice administration with the emphasis on prison administration and rehabilitation. Oh, so this is something that you had already been schooled to do. Yes. Wow. Yes. What, what made you get into that specialty? Well, I think what had happened was I wanted to get into law enforcement, and that's kind of where I fell into after taking a few classes early on at the University of Guam because my initial major was business. Mm. And then I took a criminal justice class, and I just fell in love with it, and that's where I went the went full gamut forward all the way to Shamana University to get my master's. And then at Shamana, I took a couple of classes um, in prison administration. I did. Uh, I worked for the Hawaii Paroling Authority while I was there, so I worked in and out of the prison. Wow. And so dealing with the inmates on the parole side, having to prep them, and I did pre-parole, prep them for release, what are the services they need, what services did they get in the prison. Mm -hmm. So it kind of led me down that path to focus a lot on what they are going to get in prison before they're released. Now, were you planning ever to be a law enforcement officer or were you just going into law, I mean, I mean had you ever thought about being a law enforcement officer as in serving on the, on the force on the, with the shield? Well, when I graduated from the University of Guam, I worked for the Judiciary of Guam as a probation officer. Mm. I got the opportunity to travel to Hawaii to go and get my master's degree, so of course I took that. Then in Hawaii, I worked for the Hawaii Paroling Authority, right. came back to Guam, uh, went back to the judiciary, and then I also went federal, so I worked for the district court wow. as a federal probation officer. Okay. Oh, so you've been, you've been all over the place I've then. been all over the place. Yeah. Is there something about this industry, because it really is kind of an industry, the prison industry, that you learned on Guam that you didn't see at maybe in other jurisdictions? Is there something unique about uh, the system here? Well, the thing about Guam that I see different, because I've worked for state and federal and then in a whole nother state for Hawaii, is, is the culture. There's always going to be somebody to help the population that I've dealt with in my career. And that's the you know pretrial and sentence offender, both in prison and outside of prison. 
and the family orientation here at Guam is what's going to make or break the success of the inmate or detainee after they get out of prison. Well, that's interesting because Hawaii has a similar culture, though, being an island. Did you find that there was anything unique about that, or is there something that there makes is? That they difficult? they do have the similar culture, but they're also a little bit more westernized, if you will, than yeah. Guam. Guam still has that very antigu and very home styled culture and family environment that's just mm. slightly different from Hawaii that I noticed. Isn't it interesting though that bec because you're not the first person who said that the support that you get from a family when somebody incarcerated has been released is is really though the same when you flip it around the same support family that you had when you got into prison. Right, right. And unfortunately there's not <coughs> much the family can say to keep you from making bad decisions. They can be there and tell you, you know, that's a bad decision. Don't do that. You know, it's better if we work together and do this. But not until someone has lost their freedom by either going to prison or ending up on probation and being under the supervision of the court do they realize how important it was to make better choices. Mm -hmm. And so if the family just doesn't give up and is there to support that family member throughout the process, even after they made the mistake, then their success rate will definitely go up. And so you've seen that. You've yes. seen uh, not a whole lot of return visitors back to the um, back, back to the prison, back to DOC. Well, some people, they are going to be recidivists, and, and they may continue to go, and it may take them a couple of times to figure out that, you know, they're, they're done with this. They're done with the back and forth and the in prison, out of prison, on probation, off probation, you know. And some sometimes it only takes people one time, one yeah. time to realize that they don't want to do this again. Uh, how many of those people, when you take a look at the inmate population now, uh, how many of them have come back to prison after having been released? Is it, is it a low, high, is it medium, is it right for this, for this uh, I population? Think, I think here what I've seen is it's, it's, it's medium, I think. It's somewhere in the middle, but it also depends on the services that they get. I mean, it's not just about, okay, will you have family support? You need to get the services. If you have a drug problem, you need to learn how to deal with that drug problem. If you have a, a problem with stealing things, you need to learn how to deal with not, you know, stealing things. Mm -hmm. So whatever the problem is that you have, whatever that bad decision is, someone needs to teach you how to make that better choice for yourself. The family needs to be there to support you 100%. Yeah. You know? Yeah, there, there are a couple of efforts, one by the Superior Court and another by the U.S. Attorney's Office on uh, re-entry and work by, uh, sort of developing um, the incarcerated before they leave if they're on their way out. Yes. Uh, to, to sort of re-enter society uh, with a job and that sort of thing. From your standpoint from inside, um, how, is that, how is that working? How do you feel like that is working? Well, we are uh, partnered with both the United States Attorney's Office and the Judiciary of Guam on both of those re-entry mm -hmm. um, projects right now. So I think that it's, it's definitely a good start to really take a look at what the inmates need while they're inside. You look at their court judgment and you realize, okay, these are the problems that they have. How do we stop that problem from reoccurring? So to reevaluate the conditions of release, either from the court or from the uh, paroling authority, and to look at it and see what services do we need to provide to these inmates before they get out to make them successful. And the court's looking at it um, also from the pretrial standpoint, and then the U.S. attorney is. So any help we can get for our inmates, I mean, we're willing to partner up with any stakeholder that's willing to help us out. Have you had anyone come successfully through that program? Because I know it's relatively new, right? It is, it is still new. In fact, the U.S. attorney has provided us an opportunity to bring a, a particular um, successful offender back out. So he's, you know, been through the system and he's coming out to talk to our inmates and detainees uh, this weekend and Michael Santos and to yes. teach them, yeah. right, and to teach them about, you know, that you can be successful. You just have to deal with your past and to deal with the mistakes you've made and turn everything around for yourself. So that's that's been great. And the court um, has been also looking at reentry and programs that are needed. So there's task force that are formulated with the court and all the stakeholders to include, you know, the ourselves, of course, DOC, GPD, the AG's office, mm -hmm. the defenders, the bar association, and everyone comes together. And they um, were trying to figure out what's the best point of attack, if you will, to help these guys so that when they do get back out, because the bottom line is they live next to you and me. You know, you yeah. never know they're going to live down the street next to our family members. So 
What's the best way to keep them successful? It's interesting. It's an interesting concept. And then the, the idea to have it a one community approach is a big, it's sort of a wraparound kind of, you know, you envelop uh, that one particular person and try to find all of these resources to, right. to help them. Did they do, I mean, is, it's sort of standard to do a, psych, uh, a psychological evaluation just before being released from, from the prison? Well, I think that it, it depends on, on um, whether or not that's warranted, but we definitely sit down and our caseworkers will sit down and, and figure out what kind of services, what kind of help they need. Do they need housing? Do they have housing ready? Is there family support there? Um, one thing we're looking at is how to get them identification when they get out. You know, that's, if you don't have IDs, you can't, you know, go anywhere and say, oh, this is me and I'm going to apply for this job. And, and then what jobs are willing to take people that have been um, convicted of offenses? Where yeah. can we send them to? Who's willing to give them a second chance? Do you, do you get that, that brand or has it ever happened that in, under your watch where you'll have an inmate who has had maybe a career in crime and has been incarcerated for a great part of his life or her life and is very reluctant to get back into the community because they feel like they're going to fail. When I worked for the federal probation office, I had several clients like that that served ever since they may have been like 18, 19 years old. They get out 20 years later and they are afraid. Uh, they don't ever want to admit that they're afraid, but they mm. don't know how society has changed in 20 years. So they get out there and it's difficult for them. It's difficult for them to adapt to the changes that have happened while they've been incarcerated for 20 years. Yeah. Um, I know a story of a, of a client that I had as well when I was in the federal system that he didn't know how to acclimate socially. Like how do you interact with people he didn't know because he was so institutionalized. He's so used to people telling him what to do and what time to do it. Mm. So now he's just there waiting and he doesn't understand how to do things on his own so it becomes very stressful but there's also lifestyle sort of training that goes along with this program right to get to, to, to when prisoners are released right we try community. to you know teach them especially those that have been incarcerated for long periods of time you try to teach them you know how to do things and you know make sure that they they understand to come back you they got to come back to the parole or the probation officer wow. and ask for the help you that's all part of the release absolutely the conditions absolutely. Uh, we're talking with carla borja she said director deputy director of the department of corrections uh, when we come back i wanted to try to understand the strategy of the department of corrections in rehabilitating uh, those who are incarcerated it's so much different than what we see in those documentaries that they yes. see at, at state prisons where you you think boy does that actually does it even happen on guam or in the inside of the department of corrections will be right there and welcome back we are uh, really going inside the department of corrections with uh, Carla Borja, uh, our guest on something to th talk about. Thanks a lot for for stopping by today. You're welcome. Um, well, the strategy, the method by which every prison sort of adopts a, a strategy or a, uh, on how they're going to rehabilitate. That's the idea. Right. Uh, and and I'm assuming that you don't have the same side of strategies as you might see uh, with m more imposing, um, you know, methods that there are used in state prisons. It's different and a lot of it depends on our resources and especially funding, what we're able to provide in our facility versus a facility that maybe has more money than we do mm -hmm. and more resources. Well, do, is it more money or is it the kind of crimes that you're, or cr kinds of criminals that we're talking about or does that matter? Well, I, they both go hand in hand. So whatever it is that we need to provide, whatever services we need to provide, we need to find a way to get that service and you know everything costs money yeah so we figure out like who we need to contract who we need to hire what kind of classes our caseworker uh, or our forensics unit need to provide to the majority of our inmate population mm -hmm. to give them the services and the rehabilitative efforts and treatment that they need before they get back out so is that the strategy are you trying to is and do you have a I mean you have an option on which method that you want to use right. It's not a really heavily armed prison. Right. Corrections officers aren't walking around with billy clubs and and um, you know heavy armory uh, at all. This is a sort of more relaxed, if you will. I you know what I mean. As relaxed as prisons can be, 
if you were looking at it <clears throat> from you know from our view, we watch these documentaries. Right. I'm, right. You know, I don't have a lot of I don't have a lot of experience. Thank God. Uh, with the thing. inside, yeah, what, I, and I'm proud of that. But but for those of us who don't understand or don't see what you see. Well, you got to look first at the facility. Our facility is a multifaceted facility. Most most prisons in the states are either a prison of different security levels, so it could be a maximum security prison, which you'll see more um, perimeter officers, mm -hmm. armed officers, depending on the makeup of that prison, medium or minimum. Some can be halfway houses. Um, some are just jails, but ours, we handle all of them. We handle all population of inmates at different security levels, and we take care of the detainees on the jail side. So you're going to see that total mix. And we're also a correctional institution, and if that's different from a penitentiary. Right. They don't have a lot of rehabilitation. Um, our goal is to build up our rehabilitation programs that have so faltered. that's the difference. Yeah, yes. Correctional facility has it's the it's the approach to rehabilitation, correct? As opposed to a penitentiary, penitentiary that does what they house inmates and they sort of right. They have certain services, of course, that are, are needed and required, but a penitentiary is different. You're not going to see the freedom, like you said. You feel like if you're looking at Department of Corrections, you feel it's a little bit more laid back, a little bit more relaxed because it's considered a correctional institution. And so, I mean, we do have our maximum security inmates. They don't have the flexibility to walk around the mm -hmm. facility as freely as some of our minimum security inmates. Mm -hmm. um, then we also have our detainees and our detail. So, um, so it just depends on the security level of the of what the prison is servicing. Are you concerned at all about the growing numbers of people that are living in Guam and have the potential to commit crimes and have the potential to be institutionalized at DOC? Absolutely. That facility can only handle so much. And we're already at an overpopulated level right now, which is why we are also been working with the judiciary on a bail reform, the three days count, um, with the judiciary and the AG is also involved in that as well. And so we've been looking at um, how we can look at bail reform and pretrial confinement reform and whether or not everyone should be confined just because they can't afford to be released. Mm -hmm. So that's that's one angle to look at. Um, but on the other side, we're also concerned that, you know, if, if we don't get enough, especially if you're looking at the youth, if you don't get enough after school programs, summer programs right now, what are they left to do but get into some kind of trouble? Yeah, idle minds uh, right. usually mean that they're gonna get into trouble. Right. Uh, talk to me about the women's facility. It sounds to be much smaller. It is. The right. women's facility is just one a housing unit that houses all security levels versus our male population is in different housing units throughout the compound. Okay. What yes. is it about uh, about the female I inmate that is much different? What is the psychology? Help me out with that. I think it just depends on what the female struggle is. I think it's the same as, as the men. Just you don't see as many females out there doing the crime that most of the men do, but they're out there. They mm. may not get caught, they may not be reported, um, but they're out there just the same. They do the same type of crime. Yeah. Right. Have you, have we ever been in a position to address uh, a, a, a pregnant female that has to be incarcerated? And is there a program like they have in other I jurisdictions where the mother raises a baby right there in the facility? Unfortunately, we don't have that program here on Guam and we don't have the facilities to have it. You obviously want to separate that mother and child bonding time away mm -hmm. from the regular housing unit where all the other inmates are housed. Um, but we do have the medical facility. I mean, we, we have our clinic and so we take care of, we've had pregnant inmates before and we mm -hmm. make sure that she gets all her prenatal care. But unfortunately, when it's time to give birth, the baby has to go with a family member and then the mother has to come back to the facility. The Department of Corrections, as, as you might know, um, also is in charge of the lockup facility at Agania. Yes. So that's all under your jurisdiction. Uh, what, how do you address the, whatever issues? I, don't need, I hardly ever hear of, their, of the issues down at, uh, in Agania. Well, in like I said, the uh, Department of Corrections houses the sentenced population pre-trial detainees, and we also house the federal and then mm -hmm. the females. So we house everybody except for the juveniles. So we take care of everyone except for so the So wherever that, it, it, it doesn't just depend on what what process, I mean, what part of the case that you're in to determine whether it's a lockup or a DOC? Yes, you're either sentenced or you're not sentenced. Right. So once you're sentenced to a crime and you get your, you know, your time that you have to serve, 
then you're you either you go up to Mingilao. No. Aganya is only for those that are on pretrial detention. Mm. So they're waiting sentencing or waiting disposition. It could be they're waiting to go to trial. Yeah. But either way, they have not been sentenced to a crime. They haven't been convicted, so they stay in Aganya. All right. Uh, talk to me about the inmates there that are there by ethnic group. There's some criticism that uh, the Department of Corrections is housing more uh, uh, criminals that come from the FSM, for example. Is there any truth to that, or do you do ethnic breakdown? We have ethnic breakdown. Um, so, but we have to remember when we when we break break down our population by ethnicity, we look at their whether or not they're from a different place versus if they're U.S. citizens. U.S. citizens are all kind of lumped together, and then you have citizens that are citizens of the FSM, citizens of other countries, maybe like Japan, Korea. And so we do have a breakdown. Um, I believe that the last we checked, it was about 20% for the FSM and all the, the island countries that are involved with the FSM. Okay. And then we have other breakdown percentages by other ethnicities. Does it matter? Does it matter uh, in the normal day-to-day -day operation? Uh, does it, I mean, one inmate from another or their ethnicity, does it matter? No, yeah. it doesn't. The only thing that matters is what type of services they need and whether or not there's conflict so we need to separate people. Yeah. I mean, as far as we're concerned, if you're a detainee, we don't care what kind of detainee you are and where you're from. If you're a sentenced inmate, you're all, it's the same. It, it breaks down to security level and whether you're male or female and where we're housing you. Um, the final question is we're going to wrap up the conversation. What is it that you, the public needs to know about how we incarcerate uh, our um, uh, criminals in Guam? You know, when you talk about the prison, sometimes people say you can't even say prisoner anymore. You can't even call it a prison. It's a correctional facility. They're called incarcerated or they're right. called inmates. And, and I think that the public still has that view that you have to be at the black and white stripe with the chain and the ball and you've got to, you know, uh, you have to have hard labor. And, and, and there right. is a section of our society that really still believes the punishment has got to be more harsh. Right. What is it that you want the public to know about the facility that you're running? Well, one thing that's difficult for, um, I think, the public maybe to understand, I mean, we understand that there's victims out there. But we also have to realize that we can't just warehouse these offenders forever. They have to be released at some point. I mean, some of them, their sentences, no, they don't have to be released. So, But at the same time, we have to still afford them some type of rehabilitation so they don't cause trouble while they're housed lifers in the mm -hmm. facility. But for those that have to be released, you have to remember that these guys are going to be released into your community. And the Department of Corrections is going to do the best to make sure that they are rehabilitated. And while they're inside, we also are the ones that are tasked with having to remember that these are, this is somebody's father, mother, mm. sister, brother, child. And so we would like them to be treated the way we want our family members to be treated should they be housed at the Department of Corrections. And I know it's hard sometimes if you don't work in that facility and you yeah. don't have to work with this population, it's hard to believe that that's the way we should treat them as like they're human beings. Right. But that's the way the Department of Corrections has done it. The way I've told my officers at the department is that you are the first point of rehabilitation for every inmate and detainee that comes in here. The way you treat them when they first come into our facility is the way they're probably going to react when they go back out. Yeah. So if you treat them like, you know, we need to rehabilitate them and, and there's, a, there's a possibility they can succeed, then mentally, they're going to head down yeah. that road They'll and They'll probably succeed. be more open Absolutely. to uh, the process. Yes, I appreciate you taking good Thank the time. You. Thank you so much. You're, You're such welcome. A delightful person to talk to and very Thank knowledgeable. You. And I appreciate that, the You're time welcome. that you've taken. And that is the, what it looks like from inside the Department of Corrections. Uh, we'll see you on the radio. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. That was great. That was great. Thank you. See you again.